MapReduce jobs. But the largest examples often come from companies like Google or Facebook. Um, recently, um, Facebook shared a blog post with a 60 terabyte production use case. And today we want to show you that processing large data sets with billions of, trans of data points is not a Google or Facebook um, domain only. So we'll start by giving you an introduction on credit card fraud and why this, this is relevant for you. Then we'll give you a high-level description of the, our approach to, to detect data breaches and compromised cards. And finally, some results on detection quality and scalability. So what happens when we do a transaction? Well, you have your card, which you can use to go to an ATM to get some cash, or to use on a point of sale for, pay for dinner or to buy some products. Or you can use your card's number and CVV and your name to do online shopping on websites. And all of these are going to send a transaction through a network or several networks. And eventually, it will get to your bank, which will do a series of tests. So it will check whether or not the card number exists, if the name on the card matches the, 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 the user, if the expiration date matches the, the, the account, or if the card has already expired or not. So, uh, and of course, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna check if, whether or not your account has balance. If all checks out, the bank is going to approve your transaction. And is going to send the response back through the network and you be able to pay for dinner or get some cash. So, with all these moving parts, what could go wrong? Well, fraud could go wrong. If a fraudster gets your card number or information, it can make a physical copy of the card. Um, it doesn't even need to do a physical copy of the card. It can just store the numbers of the card and use them. But if it has a physical copy of the card, it can go to an ATM and get some cash, or to a point of sale to buy some products to later resell, or can use the numbers on the, on the card to, to buy online. And the bank will not know that this transaction comes from a fraudster, because it's your card. It's exactly the same information that goes on your card, but it's a fraudster that's providing it. So the bank will approve the transaction. This is where FeedZi comes in. We help banks decide whether or not this transaction comes from a fraudster. For example, if if you only use your card in Lisbon and suddenly you're in South Africa buying dresses, that's weird. That's not the typical behavior of, of the client. So someone should take a look into that and check whether or not it's really the, the card owner that it's using the card. And here at Fidzai, we do that using machine learning techniques and we help banks decide whether or not they should approve the transaction. At this point, you may be thinking, oh, that, that won't happen with me. I have my card always safely stored on my wallet, so nobody can get my card. Well, what is this? It's an ATM, right? Well, that's not true. On the left, it's an ATM. But on the right, which is the picture I showed you, it's a card skimming device. So does, an, does anyone spot any difference? Raise your hand if you spot at least one difference. Yeah, I've showed you, right? <laughs> so here's an, extra card. here's an extra card reader. If you put your card there, it will read the magnetic stripe and get every single information on your card except the pin. Does anyone spot another difference? Raise your hand, please. Two people. So there's another there. OK? That's, that's a camera to get, to get your pin because it's the information that was missing. And just in case you do like your bank tells you to do, which is cover the pin very carefully, yeah, yeah, there's a keyboard overlay over there, so there's no way to, to skip it. So what happened? Well, a fraudster came in, installed the mini scanner, which is, it looks pretty normal. 
And it's a really small device, so you can just be glued to something and then nobody will notice. He added the camera to get the, the pins. And added the cell phone for communication and battery, because if, if the authorities know that this, this ATM is compromised, it would be dangerous for the fraudster to go there and physically get the cards. So if he has a way of doing that at a distance, it would be better for him, it would be safer. And finally, a keyboard overlay, just in case you cover your hands. And at that point, you can just literally sit down, have a drink, and wait for people to go to the ATM and get their cards stolen. So you may be thinking, OK, I'm done with ATMs. I'm never going to use ATMs anymore. Well, that, that ain't going to solve it. A skimming device may be planted inside a point of sale. A keyboard or even a full point of sale overlay may be planted. And if all else fails, fraudsters can get hundreds of thousands of cards in a single data breach. So there's pretty no way to escape this, this problem. I've prepared a video for you to, to witness how easy it is for fraudsters to plant a skimming device. Did you spot it? Did you see what happened? Anyone who see what happened, can you raise your hand, please? Yeah, you were checking that. But there were people that either they were not paying attention or they didn't see it. So let's look at it again. So these two guys come in. And this guy is going to talk with the cashier, while this, is, this guy is already preparing something on his bag. And look. He's even smiling. And as soon as she turns her back, this guy is three, two, one, bam. At this point, every single card that, that, get, that passes there is going to be stolen. This is how easy it, it is. It took five seconds for these two guys to plant a skimming device. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the presentation to my, my colleague, Miguel. And he's going to continue from here. Thanks, James. Can you guys hear me? So let's think a little bit about how bad the fraud landscape is. Because you know, this is a video that will raise awareness, but it's just it's one video. So let's see how bad this is. Data breaches are on the rise. Even though they are you know, in the news everywhere, the community still hasn't figured out how to stop them or even to just slow them down. And I'm afraid to tell you that if you haven't been a victim of a data breach yet, it's quite likely to happen throughout your lifetime at some point. Sorry for the bad news. Here's a chart from, uh, from Verizon from this year showing the number of data breaches per year. As you can see, not showing signs of slowing down. This is in number of data breaches. And here's from three weeks ago a chart showing what has been hacked just, just in the past three years. Okay, let's not, let's not make it too dark. So you guys are in computer science probably, so you're probably in one of these things, you know. Do you use Facebook? Or do you have something from Apple? Do you use Adobe? Evernote, if you've been in college, likely. You know, if you're American, Target, Home Depot, eBay, the voter database. Hey, if you're from Turkey, the Turkish citizenship database. Congratulations, you've been hacked. Or maybe you say, nah, pff, I don't care. I only use the internet for gaming. Well, Ubisoft is here, Minecraft is there, and you say, no, you know, I only use Linux. Well, look over there, the Clinton campaign. You know, th there's names here, I don't even know what they are, to be honest. Okay, so. Pretty much everything has either been hacked or 
there's a likelihood that it might be hacked at some point, okay? So if you use this something that you might have heard of called the internet, you're quite likely to, to be a victim of a hack at some point. This was from three weeks ago. This is from roughly one week ago. There was this minor hack, tiny hack called Yahoo. You might have heard of it. And you might notice that there are some things here that weren't there before. So they, they're either hacks that happen now or hacks that were found out about just now. This is in terms of you know, how many people are impacted and so on. Now let's think about how much money this costs. This is a chart showing you how much fraud is costing worldwide in the past a little bit more than a decade. As you can see again, growing and not showing signs of slowing down, quite the opposite. It seems to be accelerating. As you can see, two years ago in 2014, this went a little bit over $16 billion. This is already comparable to the GDP of this country where you're sitting. It's something like 10 or 20% of the GDP, uh, roughly in that margin, I think. Don't quote me on that, though, because I don't have the right number on my head. And in four years, it's going to be double, 35 billion. So as you can see, this is something to be worried about. And at Feedsai, we're fighting fraud, and we ask ourselves all the time, what can we do to stop this, right? What can we do? And the question that started the, the project that we're going to talk to you about started with this question, can we detect compromised cards? And I would even go as far as say, can we predict that a card will be a victim of fraud before it's actually used for fraud? So try to preemptively stop an attack and, uh, apart from just blocking transaction by transaction. That's the goal of this project here. And we wanted to detect, if possible, entire data breaches. So that's something we call breach radar. It's an algorithm we developed to, in our research team to, to tackle this problem. And the goal is to find something we call points of compromise. And let me start by answering this question, which most of you will have on your mind, which is, what is a point of compromise? Well, our definition is that it's a point in space-time where the information about a card was stolen. So, if I use my card in an ATM and a fraudster has installed a device that steals the information there, and six months later my card is used for fraud, I want to know that this card was a victim of fraud because six months ago it passed through that specific ATM in that specific day. That's what we mean by finding a point of compromise. If Jaime's card was stolen in a data breach, uh, from three months ago, and then he's a victim of fraud, we want to know that his card was stolen in that specific data breach. Because if we know a place where cards were stolen, we can see other cards that passed there and haven't yet been used for fraud, and we block them preemptively. So, how can we detect these points of compromise? Well, the idea is that you take stolen cards, so frauds that, uh, sorry, cards that were used for fraud, and you find places where they were at the same time, at the same place. So common points of purchase between cards that were used for fraud. If many cards that were victim of fraud share a space-time point, so they passed in the same place at the same time, it's likely a point of compromise. And if you want more details, sorry, I can't give you a lot more, I'm afraid. This is uh, pending a patent request, so we cannot give you a lot more details for now about the algorithm itself. We can, however, tell you the results that we get from this. And let me tell you a little bit about that. First, let me tell you how we use this. So I can't tell you how the algorithm works, but if you have a black box that tells you the probability that something is a point of compromise, as soon as we know that, 
we can block the cards that interacted with this point of compromise, and we reissued the cards to the customers of the bank. So for example, picture these two situations. Situation one, you get a call from your bank saying, hey, we noticed that you used a the ATM in Chiado in front of cafe, whatever, and we have good reason to believe that this specific ATM was targeted by fraudsters, so we're going to block your card, even though none of your money has been stolen, and we're going to give you a new card. And you say, cool, I love my bank. They keep me safe. Situation two is, you're at home, you look at your bank extract online, and suddenly you're missing 3,000 euros, or 5,000. Obviously, the first situation is much better. So that's what we're trying to do. And we do it periodically. So for example, <clears throat> imagine this is the time, and you, do, you run the algorithm to find points of compromise here. So you run on the data you have in the past. Obviously, you don't run in the future. You don't have that data yet. You find some places that were compromised, and because of that, you can prevent a lot of clients from being targets in the future. We'll tell you how much we prevent quantitatively in, in a bit. And then you just repeat this periodically, like I said. You do it again. You find other points of compromise, and you block cards from being used in the future, and so on. So how much fraud can we prevent? So this is, this is an idea. I hope you like the idea. But, you know, it's just an idea until you put it in practice and you see whether it actually works. And I want to convince you that it does work. With this technique that we, were, that we are telling you about, we caught in a, I would say, a medium-sized client, not even one of our large clients. In one year, this algorithm caught and prevented $52.5 million. So it was worth my salary and Jaime's salary and the salary of the rest of the team to develop this. Uh, we protected 46,000 people from being victims of fraud, or who would be victims of fraud later, of which 42,000 were protected before they were ever a victim of fraud. So only about 4,000 of those people were victims at least once because of a point of compromise. So this is, a, this is huge, you know? Less than 10% of the people that, are, that have their information stolen in a data breach or in a card skimming device or something like that end up being victims. More than 90% we protect them. We also have a fairly low rate of false alarms. This number here is more technical, but to make it easier for you, this is we make one mistake in every, every 2,500 transactions. So this is um, also something we are happy about, is that the algorithm catches a lot of fraud, and it doesn't launch alerts for many wrong things. And we also verified um, by looking at the places that were detected as points of compromise that they were actual data breaches. We confirmed them by looking at government sources or sometimes even just news articles saying this thing was hacked, that thing was hacked, this other place was hacked. And when that, when that kind of news comes out, we go back to the points of compromise that we have found at our clients and we see, yeah, we, we caught them. We caught them before they were on the news. We say that this has good sensitivity as well for large points of compromise, where more than 100,000 cards are compromised, or small ones with less than 2,000 cards. So we're also happy about that. We're very happy with this algorithm overall. OK, that's nice. This means that we have an algorithm that is capable of detecting points of compromise and compromised cards. Uh, with good precision and high detec detection rates. So that's nice. But what about computational performance? It's not enough to be good. It has to be fast and scalable enough 
to, to handle the amounts of data we have at FISA. We have data sets with billions of transactions. If it's slow, it's not going to work. So let's review our goal again. We want to find the common points of purchase across compromised cards. This means that we want to look at the transactions that occurred on the cards before they were victims. So we need to inspect those transactions of the compromised cards before the fraud has happened. Let's keep that here such that we don't forget. Now let's look at a, a naive approach that would solve this problem. For each transaction on the data set, we check if the, tra the, the transaction is fraudulent. And if it is, we know that this card has been compromised in the past. So we need to look at the past transactions of the card. So for each transaction in the data set, we are going to check if it's from the same card of the other loop, check if it's legitimate, and then if it's before the fraud on that card. And we process the transaction if so. So let's review this again. For all transactions from compromised cards before it was used fraudulently. So we have a full, a full transaction. We have to inspect all transactions of the data set. And then for each one, we have to inspect the data set again. So congratulations, you've got yourself a quadratic algorithm. At this complexity, a data set with 1 billion transactions, which is not the biggest we have, which is 10 to the power of 9, would make you do 10 to the power of 18 comparisons. That's about the grains of sand in the world. So that's a lot of transactions. Let's, let's try an example. Visa, one of the largest payment processors in the world, repeats a peak throughput capacity of 56,000 transactions per second. At that rate, we would take more than 500,000 years to complete. Let's put this in other words. If you had started when the Neanderthals were first appearing, we would still be computing. These guys went extinct first. So that's a lot of time. Let's try another less naive approach. For each transaction in the data set, we will check if the transaction is fraud. And if it is, this means that the card is fraudulent, and we save the card number and the fraud date on a separate table. Then. For each transaction in the data set, you check if the, car, the transaction comes from a compromised card on your separate table over there, oops, and if it is before the fraud transaction. If so, we process the transaction and feed it to Bridge Radar. This means that you have a full traversal and then another independent one. So our algorithm now uh, grows linearly with the number of transactions, which is much better, but it still requires two traversals through data. We did this with one traversal. We made use of several Spark features. We can tell you the details, of course, but uh, the main point here is that if you don't design your algorithms with some thought into it, you'll end up with poorly scalable algorithms and very large runtimes, which will simply not work with the certain types of, of, of data. So let's talk about the real world deployment. We had a data set of worth of one year of data with several billion transactions to process and a relatively large cluster to do so. So our approach is really easy to deploy, including passing through security, workspace setup, installing the application, running a first test on a small sample. We took like two hours uh, of arriving at the client. And by small, I mean 120 gigabytes. So let's use some codes here. In the end, we were able to process a data set that had several billion transactions with way over three terabytes of data. It's client data, so I can't give you much details, but we did so at an average throughput of one million transactions per second, which in dollars is something like $100 million per second. So, and remember, Visa processes up to 56,000 transactions per second. They are one of the biggest guys. So we can process transactions at much faster rates than they occur. Okay, so as a final note, we did hit some 
Java and Spark limits, but we managed to solve them with some minor tinkering around, so it's, I just wanted to let you know that we've stumbled upon these kinds of, of limits. I'm going to pass to Miguel. Thanks. So, last thing I wanted to tell you is that in case you like what you hear, as you can see, we have a lot of challenges to solve. You saw a few, like the, the fact that we have an adversary, the fact that we have large data sets, uh, the fact that we have to use a technology stack that is quite vast, so we need a lot of different skills. We didn't even touch some of them, like the fact that this is a very unbalanced problem because there's roughly one in 1,000 transactions that is fraud, so most classifiers will just tell you everything is not fraud that gives you huge accuracy because you are right most of the time. So this has to be solved as well. And a number of other challenges. So it's quite challenging work to do research or to do development on this field. If you like that, if that tickles you, let's say, we're hiring. Feedsai is hiring a lot. Um, I would say none of the companies here of this size are hiring at this scale or even close. We, in terms of background, we do value PhDs, but they're not required. There's a number of FeedsI people here at this event, some of which have PhDs, some do not. We value that, but we're also sensible to people that are excellent without having a PhD. That's totally fine. In terms of backgrounds that you might have, you might come from informatics or computer science. You might come from biomedical engineering, from physics, from electrical engineering, aerospatial engineering, mathematics, you know, statistics, some other things that we didn't put in the slide. I think we have, of these six, I think we have at least one of each at Feedsai. And for the positions we're hiring for data scientists, such as myself and Jaime, both for the research team and for client work. We're hiring data engineers, so let's say a hybrid between a data scientist and a more classical software engineer. Uh, this will usually be someone who started as a developer and then s began to learn some, some good skills about data science or the other way around, a data scientist that is particularly good at programming and we also need software developers, both for front-end and for back-end. We also need people for our QA team to test the product, and so on. So we're going to be around for a while longer, half an hour, 45 minutes maybe, before we go back to the office. So feel free to pass by. If you exit through that door, the Feedsai booth is right in front of your nose. You won't miss it. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the team that worked on this. It was more than just Jaime and myself. Uh, this was started by um, a PhD student that did an internship at Fizai, which is this guy here, Miguel Araújo, uh, along with myself. And then Jaime, Luis, Marianne, and Fang touched the project at different stages. Uh, it's a project that lasted for a while. And Pedro here, who is one of the founders of the company, and he's the leader of the research team. So all of these people were involved at some point. I wanted to tell you this, not only to acknowledge the people that worked, that performed this fine work, but also to show you that this is in a way a proof that the project is, that, that the research team is flexible and agile. You know, people worked on the project, then did other things. Uh, new people come in, there's proper documentation, the code is done properly, there's code review and all of that stuff that ensures the smoothest possible transition from person to person. That's all I wanted to tell you. In case you're interested, this is the link you can follow to apply or you can just come speak to us. Thank you very much for your time. We have at least one question. Hey, Hawaii. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So what kind of problems did you solve in Spark? Not with Spark, because that kind of covered, but I guess you were streaming the transactions through Spark? I didn't get the question. I'm sorry. So I guess you guys are streaming the transactions through Spark, and you mentioned you solved some operational problems in Spark? 
Yes. Right? So can you go into more detail with that? Or? We, well, I, I'm not sure Come how on. much detail. I, I'm, I'm really not sure how much detail we can give you about Spark. Uh, yeah, I shouldn't, because I would have to ask what we can disclaim or not. As Miguel said, uh, we are waiting a patent approval, and the, the current version of, of the, this algorithm is currently being implemented in the product, so there's, it's too soon for me to disclaim anything that much. But I can tell you that we didn't do anything fancy with Spark. That, that I can tell you. It's, Really, it's really, really, really simple stuff. If you, could, you probably can, can replicate this if you think, okay, let's keep it simple. And okay, you have to be smart of how to use the map reduces, how to do the group buys. But that's pretty much it. We didn't have to tinker with the code of Spark or anything like that. Facebook did it. They had to, but we didn't. We just kept it simple, and it is really possible to make it work at scale. So did you use Spark ML or Spark SQL or something like that? No, or we did not. Just, just straight up Scala yeah. code. I can tell you, RDDs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I think we have time for more questions. Hey, hey. Okay. So I'm with Fizai, but uh, let me just add up to that that I'll be having a talk right after at 2 p.m. about Spark, about technical stuff what we've been facing not only on this project but in others and uh, how we overcome it. It's mostly lessons learned, but you may learn something with it. So show up at 2 and we may talk about Spark then. Nice t-shirt. More questions? Uh, hi. Actually, <laughs> thank you for presentation. Uh, I had a question which is could be for me to get information. Uh, I don't know, maybe I missed this part. You are using the machine learning probably, yes, to detect the fraud. I can't, I can't, I can't. Sorry, uh, can't, you can't really pick you out. Sorry, you are probably using the machine learning techniques to, you, to detect the fraud. Yes, we're all, we are using machine learning. To yes, detect uh, is it possible to know which kind of techniques you are using and why? Yeah, I can tell you a little bit about that, sure. Okay. Um, our let's say our normal algorithm to detect fraud is classification, to classify as fraud or not fraud, which is um, two labels, so one or zero, let's say. Uh, so we do that. It's an unbalanced problem, as I was saying. So the number of fraud transactions is roughly one in 1,000. So the, one of the challenging problems we face is that pretty much any algorithm you find in the toolboxes out there scikit-learn, Weka, in R, whatever you feel like using, you feed data that only has one positive case out of every 1,000, and all of those toolboxes will just tell you everything is not fraud. Because you get 99.9% .9 accuracy. That's huge, right? Except that if we go to our clients and say, hey, we have an algorithm that gets 99.9% .9 accurate by telling you that everything is not fraud. It's kind of tricky to sell this. So that's one of the challenges we face. We use a number of different algorithms for classification. Um, in most of the cases, the algorithm itself, it's not fancy. So you would replicate, let's say, the, um, the quality of the predictions with toolboxes out there if you could solve the unbalancedness of the problem. But the implementation is different. It's much, much, much faster. So. Most of the work that was done so far is in creating algorithms that are very, very, very fast and will work at these scales that we showed you here and larger. We have data sets larger than the ones we showed here. We have clients larger than the ones that were mentioned here. So that's, I hope I partially answered your question at least. If you want, we can discuss a little bit more uh, offline. I'll be happy to share some more details. More questions? Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, that technology looks amazing, but incredibly creepy. Will the bank clients know that you're doing that with their information? 
Okay. It's a relevant question about privacy. So first of all, let me tell you that usually we, Fidzai, don't get access to a lot of private information. We don't get card numbers, like specific card numbers. We get anonymized card IDs. Uh, depending on the clients, we usually don't get any personally identifiable information. Although sometimes we can ask the client to do, let's say, please run this code comparing, let's say, the name of the user with his email, for example. Or please create a feature that is if the shipping address is the same as the billing address. So we can create some interaction in these cases. In a lot of other cases, we ourselves, so the data scientists from Fizai, go to the client premises and work there to create these features. And while we're there, we can see that information, but it never comes to Fizai. So I hope that answers your question. More questions? One over there. Hi. Uh, thank you for presenting us, Fizai. Uh, my name is Pedro Costa. I'm uh, concerned about data governance, and I've uh, asked uh, Isabel earlier uh, uh, the same question. And I would li uh, I'd like to, to hear you guys uh, talk about uh, a little bit of, about uh, data governance. What, how do you guarantee data quality in your data? Uh, how do you know, uh, okay, a card is from this bank? Uh, how do you guarantee these descriptions? All along uh, uh, the, the process, the, the, the machine learning process, uh, what do you use for uh, uh, this data governance? Okay, very relevant question as well. Um, most of the time, when we go to a client to do some data science work, the earlier stages of the project are spent understanding the data, cleaning the data. You know, we've had, we've had everything. We have cases where we get a CSV file in, in HDFS, and then some columns are shifted, so, you know, there's an off by one. This happens more often than it should, to be honest. It's just uh, big data is hard. Um, so the earlier stages are spent understanding the data, and it's fairly frequent that there's some ping pong, let's say, between our team and the client's data scientists or data engineers to tell them, hey, listen, this data that you provided us, like, I don't know, the table with the fraud information and the table with the transaction information, the join is empty. Like, you know, some, this hap has happened. And it's fairly normal because these are complex systems. Our clients are pretty big. Usually the data is scattered in multiple databases. Sometimes there's not a single person with access to everything and multiple people have to get us different pieces of information. So all of this naturally is, is somewhat error prone on the side of the client. And there's some ping pong back and forth to, to understand the data and to get the data in, in proper quality. Then we have our own tools, our own analysis. Uh, we, we have some of our own tools. We also use a lot of you know command line, um, Python scripts and stuff like that. So stuff that you can use yourself to validate, let's say, we get a data set, we count how much fraud is in the data set. If we see that half of the transactions are fraud, we know that something is wrong. So we do these kinds of sanity checks. Of course, some things might, go, might slip through the cracks, uh, but we try to validate quite well because you will lose a lot more time if you miss something big in the beginning and you iterate on the model only to find, oh man, there was something big in the data that we didn't catch. So we, we do spend our time and we allocate time in our projects to, to go through that quite carefully. More questions? I think we have time for some more. Okay, maybe not. So like I said, we'll be right out there if you want to speak offline about something or just find out about our career opportunities or even if you're just curious about something, whatever about feeds or about fraud or something like that. Thank you again for your time.